Good evening, church. We are truly grateful to God for the grace he has granted us, bringing us through the month of May. We counted every second, every minute, every hour, every day of this month. We watched the storms of life swept many away, yet his grace has kept us standing. And we are very grateful to him tonight. Praise the name of Jesus. So I welcome you this evening to this concluding part of our series of communion services that ran through the entire month. Praise the Lord. Before we break bread tonight, there is a subject that I believe the Spirit of God has placed in my heart. And I want us to look at a few scriptures to discuss this subject on how to manifest the God life. The God life. There is the God life. It is the life we refer to as the higher life. We refer to it as the higher life. We call it the higher life because it is superior to the natural life. It is superior to the life of men. There is a higher life and God wants his children to work in that life and to live in that dimension. You know, there's a scripture we've always quoted for, and I, I think I should begin from that scripture. It's a scripture that in the book of Romans chapter 8, it says that the earnest expectation of the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And most often, when we quote that scripture, you know what comes to your mind first is that the world is waiting for the manifestation of the power of God. It's true. But can we properly define that power? there is a strong need for us to correctly define what power of God we are talking about. The manifestation of the sons of God speaks about the revelation of the sons of God, people who will live like God, people who will function like God. And can I... Can I say this to us tonight? Please give me your attention and be patient with me. God does not see the devil as a threat. God does not see the devil as an issue because Jesus resolved the issue of the devil on the cross. Is that not so? And confidently he declared, it is finished. When he said it was finished, he meant it. The devil was finished. In fact, Paul writing to the Colossians, the church in Colossae, he tells them in Colossians, he said that Jesus spoiled principalities. He spoiled them. And he nailed them to his cross. He did not just spoil them. The scripture says he made an open show. Follow me closely. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
And let's read from verse number four quickly to verse 11. This is going to bless you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 4 to 11. It says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are so many gifts, but the same spirit. Keep reading, we're going up to verse 11. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. Please give me that verse in a simpler translation. He says, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Uh, make it the amplified, maybe. Let's see. Yes. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. Now he uses the word illumination. He uses the word illumination. What does it mean to illuminate? To shine. So the primary assignment of the Spirit of God in our lives is to shine through us. I'm trying to take you somewhere and this is going to bless you. Just follow me closely. Verse number 8. To one is given, now, if you look at verse 7, uh, he ends in verse 7 by saying, go back to verse 7. He says, the illumination of the Spirit for good and profit. That means it should do you good and you should profit from it. Are you with me tonight? Talk to me, are you with me tonight? All right. So verse 8 says, to one is given in and through the Holy Spirit the power to speak a message of wisdom and to another the power to express a word of knowledge. Put that in the King James Version, it's shorter and easier. Um, to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, verse number nine. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, verse 10. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. These are all the gifts of the Spirit. Everybody say gifts. It's a gift. Now, a gift is a gift. That's what it is. A gift is a gift. Keep reading. Verse 11, finally. But all this work that one and the same self spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So, according to, uh, go back to the Amplified on this one verse. He tells you clearly that this gift we are talking about, he says all these gifts, he calls them gifts. All these gifts, achievements, abilities, abilities. I like the word ability because the gifts manifest as an ability. All right, the gifts manifest as what? An ability. So they are inspired and brought to pass by one and the same Holy Spirit who apportions to each person individually exactly as he chooses. Wonderful. So, speaking in tongues is a gift. Working of miracles is a gift. These are very important assets that the Holy Spirit gives to those who are God's children. However, now please listen to me carefully. However, this is where you must not miss me tonight. However, in spite of the fact that these gifts are so important and they come from the Holy Spirit, these gifts are not what identify the life of God in you. They are not. The gifts are gifts. That's what they are.
The gifts are a demonstration of God's ability. That's what they are. But the gifts, this, look, when you cast out devils, when you speak in tongues, when you discern, when you have word of knowledge, all those things we mentioned, they do not define the nature of God in you. They are a gift, and that's what they are. Let me explain it this way. If you meet a rich man, a man who is really rich, how many of you have seen a rich man before? Or a rich woman? You've seen one that's really rich. You've seen one before. Okay, if you haven't seen anyone, you are looking at one right now. <laughs> Glory to God. For free, for free. You are looking at one for free. You don't have to travel far to go and find one out. <laughs> when you look at a man who is truly rich, do you need to see his bank account before you will know he's rich? No. You see it from the way he carries himself. You see it from his mannerisms. You take, you, you don't say, let me see your wallet to know you are a rich man. No, you don't. There is an aura. That's why Paul calls it an illumination. There is an atmosphere that he carries. You will know. He will not tell you. You will know. Okay. How many of you have seen a drunkard before? <laughs> you are not looking at what? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I choose right. <laughs> when you see a drunkard, you don't say, let me smell him to know if he's drunk. Is that not so? How do you know? You know it from his footsteps. You know, you know it from his footsteps. His mannerisms will tell you he's drunk. He's coming from a distance. And you look at him and you say, that guy is drunk. Because when a guy takes one step, You know, you can tell, you can tell. Now, when Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, he describes, he describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives not by his power, but by his nature. That's why he says, don't be drunk with wine. Verse number 18, Ephesians chapter 5. He says, don't be drunk with wine. He says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he tells us that as a child of God, you should not allow yourself to manifest the behavioral, the attributes of one who is drunk with wine, but there is a behavior of one who is filled with the Spirit. Now, I'll show you this quickly before we continue. The reason why the emphasis is you see, in, in, in 1 Corinthians, where we read, chapter 12, Paul takes time to itemize all the gifts. But he's leading us somewhere. He's leading us somewhere. The reason is because, you see, the gifts of the Spirit can be counterfeited. 
The devil can produce a counterfeit of every gift of the spirit because he once lived in that dimension. But when Satan fell, He fell because sin had corrupted his nature. So there was one thing that the devil did not take out of heaven. He couldn't take the nature of God. So he can make a counterfeit of miracles, but he cannot make a counterfeit of the nature of God, which is love. He cannot. There is a scripture, Revelation, quickly, Revelation chapter, I, I think it should be Revelation chapter 16. I want to show you. Revelation chapter 16 from verse 13. Just read two verses. Give it to me in the Amplified. You will love it. He says, and I saw three loathsome spirits like frogs leaping from the mouth of the dragon and from the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet, 14. For really, they are the spirits of demons that perform signs, wonders, miracles. So there are spirits of demons that can perform signs. There are spirits of demons that can perform what? Wonders. There are spirits of demons that can perform miracles. That's the point I'm trying to establish to you. That the emphasis, you see, when you talk about the manifestation of the sons of God, the emphasis is not the miracles. The emphasis is the nature of God. Are you with me now? Are you following me tonight? So I hear you. So, miracles, when you say, speak in tongues to show that you are a child of God or you have the spirit of God, that is a delusion. That can be manipulated. It is not every tongues that people speak that is of the spirit of God. You know the story of Egypt and Moses and the miracles that the magicians, everything Moses did, the magicians of Egypt counterfeited. You see, we are a generation that is in love with physical things. And we are excited by power and manifestation of powers. And the devil knows these things. But the true sons of God are not manifested or revealed by power. They are revealed by nature. That's why the Bible says God is love. When he says God is love, that is his nature. That is his being. That is who he is. That's how he functions. You cannot change him. God can demonstrate his power in the morning and withhold it in the evening. But the love of God cannot be demonstrated in the morning and withheld in the evening. His love is eternal. That's why when you come to Christ and you become a child of God, you are so confident of the fact that you have been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and you are confident of the love of God for you. You are so confident of that love, you know nothing can change it. I was sharing a scripture with you the other day. I don't know how many of you remember or you truly heard when I was talking about it. When I said, see, 
Because you are a child of God and you committed a sin or you made a mistake, God does not instantly take his Holy Spirit away from you. No, he does not. And I told you, I said, that's why the scripture speaking about David, David had sinned and he was crying out to God. And what did he say? Take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Which means the Holy Spirit was still in him. He had lost his joy, but the Holy Spirit was still there. Because the nature of God never changes. Hallelujah. Now, in John chapter 13 and verse 35, Jesus makes a statement so powerful. And I want us to read it together. John 13, 35. Give it to me in the Amplified Version. I love this. 13, 35. To go. So Jesus says, this is how you will show that you are my disciple. A disciple is a follower. So he says, by this you will show that you are truly following me or you are a disciple. If you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves, he uses the word to keep on showing love amongst yourself. So the identity of a true believer is determined by the spirit of love. I'm not speaking in tongues. I'm not working of miracles. In fact, he does not say love for God. He says love for one another. So go back to 1 Corinthians and let's begin to tidy it up here. Chapter 12. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm trying to show you tonight, brothers and sisters, there is a higher life beyond working of miracles. There is a higher life beyond manifestation of power. There is a higher life beyond speaking in tongues. Are they important? Yes. In fact, if you don't speak in tongues as a Christian, you will suffer constant depression. Spiritual depression to start with before it gets to your mind. If you don't speak in tongues, you will not even grow because speaking in tongues builds you up. But those are main factors that are meant to help you. Your real nature, your real identity is established by the fruit of the Spirit called love. When you read Galatians Chapter number five, we're not going to go there for the sake of time. When you read Galatians chapter five, you will discover in Galatians chapter five that the scripture speaks about the fruit of the spirit as in singular and not in plural. He does not say the fruits. He said the fruit of the spirit. 
There is only one fruit of the Spirit. Why is it called the fruit of the Spirit? A tree brings forth its fruit. Every tree has one kind of fruit. There is a lemon tree outside there. You will not find mango fruits on it. No matter how much you love oranges, you will not find them on that tree. Even though they look alike, that tree can only produce one kind of fruit. The Holy Spirit produces one fruit. That fruit is called love. Brothers and sisters, believe me. The devil's attack on the church is not to stop miracles. No, it's not to stop us from speaking in tongues. No, the devil's attack in the church is the root of our being. The root of our nature. He attacks the very fiber of our love for one another. As long as he successfully does it, he does not care how many people are speaking in tongues because they will carry us nowhere. It's so important that we address this thing so that when we break bread tonight, we will understand that the first reason for which his body was broken was so that the church can be united. But so that we can be one. But so that we can see beyond our individual differences. And realize how important we all are. So when you start reading, we, we stopped at verse 11. I'm not going to continue from verse 11 because there's so much there. So let's just jump. When you go home, you can read. You're going to see that Paul takes us through a journey where he begins to explain how important, and he says, that sister prophesies, she's very important. That brother uh, uh, speaks in tongues, he's very important. That one interprets tongues, he's very important. He says, this one, he works miracle, he is very important. He says, it's the same spirit. But then he tells us that all of that is leading somewhere. He actually tells us, first of all, that there is a need for the one who does this to accept the one who does that. He tells us, and, and the entire, the core of the message is that we've got to be one. Otherwise, everything we do is a waste. So, look at what he says. Go to verse number 25. Verse number 25. He says, so that there should be no division. You see what I was telling you now. So that there should be no what? Division. Or discord. Discord, speaking about disagreement. Issues. So he tells you the reason why he is teaching you all the things, the importance of speaking in tongues, of the one who casts out demons, of the one who lays hands on the sick and the recover, and the working of signs and wonders and miracles. He says, so that there should be no division. There should be no discord or lack of adaptation of the parts of the body to each other. I love this. He talks about adaptation. That means I need to adapt myself to this man. Let me give you another word. I need to get used to the way he does things. He needs to get used to the way that woman functions. We need to adapt. The word adaptation is often used when you describe getting adopted to an environment, to a new environment. If you move from here and you go to China, you're going to have to adapt. 
We're all in Africa, but if you live here and you go to Ghana, you're going to have to adopt the heat. It's different. It's different. You have to adopt. That means you have to get used to it. Brothers and sisters, may the communion table tonight break up every boundaries, break up every divisions, break up every situation the enemy have set to put us apart. May the communion table tonight give you grace. Give, grant you grace. Now, now, please get this. Please get this. Every time I speak of grace, I think of strength. You know, when we talk about grace, most people think of favor. They think of opportunities. No, I, I think of grace as strength. And I, I'm so confident and I'm so believing God tonight. That as we break bread tonight, we will receive the strength to adapt, the strength to get used, the strength to embrace, the strength to accept. Brothers, that's all that is lacking. That is the very basic thing that is missing. I'm telling you. That is what is keeping our prosperity away. That is what is keeping. That is, what, that is the reason why you discover we cast out some, some demons, we cast them out so many times. You cast them out today, they come back again tomorrow. Because the nature that is supposed to keep them away is not there. Can I put it this way? Darkness will never flourish in the midst of light. But as soon as the light is missing, it doesn't matter what you put there, put water, put any other thing, keep money there, the darkness will come. That's what we are missing. On this last day of this month, as we break the bread, I want you to have a deep desire and hunger in you that says, I will manifest the nature of God. Look, we can have false prophets. We can have fake prophets, fake miracles all over the place. But when it comes to the love of God, that's why the other day I made a statement here and I said, you see, it is possible to smile and not still be in love. The nature of God that accepts, that embraces. I was thinking yesterday about all the things going on in the world and all the manipulations and all the mess that the politicians are putting us into. I was thinking about it yesterday and I was saying, if I were God, I'll just go and silence that one. I'll just go and kill that one. <laughs> but you see, that's why I cannot be God. Because he thinks differently. Have you noticed that sometimes the wicked people outlive the good ones? <laughs> it's because as a matter of fact, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So when he thinks of a wicked man dying, he tells himself, no. What can we do to keep him alive a bit longer? He might just embrace salvation. But precious in the sight of God is the death of his servants. So when a good man, when a child of God is passing, Heaven says, come up here quickly. The world does not deserve you. When a wicked man wants to go, heaven is saying, keep him there. He needs to be born again. He says, so that there should be no division or discord or lack of adaptation. The, the King James Version used the word schism. It says there should be no schism in the body. That means that thing that happens to create a fragmentation breaks up the body.
the lack of adaptation of the parts of the body to each other. So we are adapting to each other, adapting to each other. The longer we stay together, the more we get used to one another. So I know your weaknesses. So when you are not smiling, I don't think it, there's anything to it because I understand. So when you drop the ball, instead of condemning you, I realize, oh, he's got a weakness. I need to pray for him. And can I tell you something? Anybody you truly pray for, you cannot hate the person. Anyone you truly pray for, you cannot hate. Even when you try to hate them, you cannot. It says, but the members all alike should have a mutual interest in and care for one another. So if I realize that you are no longer showing interest in my matter, I don't pick offense against you and walk away. Instead, I will want to approach you and say to you, my brother, what happened? You've lost interest in me. I'm still here. I'm still your sister. I'm still here. I'm still your brother. No, you don't pull aside and say, well, let them do their things. We'll just be watching them. No, you don't do that. The spirit of unity heals. It forgives. Because it is motivated by love. No matter how the devil tries, he cannot love. He cannot. Keep reading. We're going to verse 27. And if one member suffers, all the parts share the suffering. If one member is honored, all the members share in the enjoyment of it. Oh, we need to get to that day. When one brother's elevation makes all of us dance and rejoice. When that sister testimony makes you smile, you are smiling out of the church and going home as if you won a jackpot because you heard the testimony of someone else. It's not like he's going to share anything with you. But you realize that because it's happening in her life, it means it's possible it can happen in your life. Because it's happening in his life, it means that it means God is in the environment. It means miracles are in the community. That's how we need to begin to function. Keep that mindset. When the one sister comes forward and shares a testimony and says, brothers and sisters, I thank God for what is done in my life this week. What you should say to yourself is, wow, it's like God is in the community. He's around. If he's in our house, it means my own house can be next. It's a picture that stayed with me a few years now. Some of you will remember. There was a young South African girl who won a beauty pageant a few years ago as Miss what? Miss Universe. Some of you have forgotten. She was declared Miss Universe at the beauty pageant, a South African girl, just a few years ago. And you know, at the beauty pageant, when you, you call the third, second place runner-up, it's a third place runner-up, something like that, and then there is a first runner-up before you call the winner. So there was that young Nigerian girl who was at the back, I think she was third runner-up or something. And when they called the girl who won, she jumped for joy. I will never forget. You need to go and Google that thing and check back those videos. 
they, they put good people. So you actually ask yourself the people of the world can rejoice at the elevation of someone else. She was in the competition. She was not announced the winner. But someone else was announced the winner. She jumped. She actually danced more than the girl who won the thing. I watched that clip and I kept saying, oh God, there are lessons for us to learn. So that other people's elevation does not become a reason for competition. No, it's not necessary. It's not. It's not. You see, the guy who bought a car today has bought a car. But he does not know what you will buy tomorrow. If you limit yourself to becoming grumpy and feeling unhappy because of what he got, you're cutting yourself short because there is a possibility that when you buy your own tomorrow, it will be something more latest, something more modern, something that has got facilities his own does not have. We need to get to the point where we mourn with those who mourn. Sincerely mourn with those who mourn. I was somewhere in the south of Joburg today and an elderly woman left me with thoughts. She said, we were talking and she said to me, she looked at me and she said, Bishop, she said, I'm so tired. I'm not attending anything. I'm not traveling anymore. I said to her, I said, Mama, go and rest. She said, yes, I'm going to rest. It's just that there's one funeral that is left. I must attend that one. <laughs> when I walked away from her, I was thinking deeply. I was thinking. The way she said it, When others mourn, does it mean anything to you? When others go through pain, does it mean anything to you? On a sincere note, he talks about suffering, he talks about enjoyment. He uses those two words. Suffering and enjoyment. And finally, verse 27. He says, now, you collectively are Christ's body. And individually, you are members of it. Each part, severally and distinct, each with its own place and function. Each with its own place. And function. Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Go to verse 28 quickly. So God has appointed some in the church for his own use. First apostle. Go to verse 30. Verse 30. Go to verse 30. He says, do all possess extraordinary powers of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Now verse 31. Verse 31. Look at it. He says, but earnestly, I want you to earnestly, that's what he says, you must earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces. The higher gifts and the choicest gifts. And yet, I will show you a still more excellent way. One that is better by far and the highest of them are love. Them. Can we stand to our feet? Can I have the tables, please? He says, I'll show you the one that is higher than them all, better than them all, 
He says, desire. He says, go for all the gifts. Desire to have a gift of healing. Desire to have speaking in tongues. He says, they are good. Desire them. As much as you can. Work in them. Ask for those graces to function in your life. He said, but yet. He says, there is a more excellent way. There is a higher life. You know, when we speak in tongues and some people don't speak in tongues around us, there's always a temptation to feel like, you know, we are the big boys. <laughs> we are the big boys. But like those ones who, they don't pray very hard. But the apostle tells us there is a more excellent way. There is a higher way. There is a bigger one. This guy may not be speaking in tongues, may not actually be healing the sick, performing miracles, doing nothing. But the love of God is embedded in him. He carries the nature of God. That one, the devil cannot penetrate. The devil cannot afflict. He carries the, the true life of God in him. That's what I want you to break the bread for tonight. Oh, that I might work in your love. That your love might work in me. That my nature will be embedded in your nature. Oh, that I might look like you. I started by saying to you, the devil is not God's problem. Why do we need power? Cast out devils because we think the devil is an issue. Why do we need power to heal the sick? Because the devil is an issue. But God does not think that those things are issues. No. He just wants to see his life replicated in us. And Paul uses the word to illuminate. So we begin to shine. So Jesus says, let your light so shine before men. That when men see these things, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. The biggest miracle we need, brothers and sisters, is not a miracle of casting out devils and killing witches and wizards. No. It is the miracle of the healing of the church so that we can accept one another. When we begin to accept one another, we will have broken through the barriers of hell because that is the one thing that torments the devil every day when brethren come together in unity. It haunts the devil. It's his worst nightmare. When we begin to try to forgive, it haunts him. It's his worst nightmare when we begin to try to, to crawl in, to adapt to one another, he does everything he can to make sure that all you see are the faults of the other person. So he will tell you, you need to tread with care. You need to tread with care. So eventually we are united, but not truly united. There are cracks. The body is disjointed. The arm is falling off. The one foot is almost disjointed. 
So our movement is not smooth. Can I tell you something? The original, please take this off. The original communion table did not look like this. The original communion table was one cup that the master gave to the one person and he drank and he gave to the other one and he drank and he gave to the other one and he drank and they all drank from the same cup. We are truly a civilized generation and we've broken ourselves apart. No wonder it hardly works for us. Because there are those who come before the table, they have already eyed somebody. If she takes from this tray, they will not take from that tray. They will take from that tray. Brothers and sisters, it's the truth of what the enemy has used to paralyze the church, to demobilize the church. And has made us so ineffective. In marriage, if you see a couple that is married and you go to the house and you discover that everybody still between the two people, the man still have his own cup, the woman still have her own cup, the man still have his own spoon, the woman has her own spoon, the man has his own towel, the woman has her own towel. It's a union that is bound to fail. It's a union that is bound to fail. He says we are one body. I love the fact that he uses the word adopt because he recognizes that we came from different places. So it's going to be difficult for me to understand this brother, but I need to work hard to understand him. I'm going to have to make room for his errors and his mistakes and his weaknesses. And instead of getting offended, I'm going to say to myself, I'm getting there. I'm understanding him better. Until one day, till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the fullness of the measure of the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. That needs to become our goal and our pursuit. I can take your entire evening, brothers and sisters, but can we pray for a few minutes tonight? And I want you to just, don't pray for anybody, pray for yourself. And you want to say, Lord, I receive grace to be adapted to the brethren. There is a strong need for us to truly function as one. When we live here tonight, let the kingdom of darkness make an announcement. Let them be intimidated by the force of unity that is being generated from here tonight. Let the messengers of hell that are listening to us tonight go back with a report that scares the enemy that the church is united and we're rising as one body. Because you know, when we were, when we're coming towards the end of this month, and approaching this past few days, I prayed and I prayed. And the more I prayed, I kept hearing one thing in my spirit, a new thing, a new thing. The Lord keeps saying to me, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. I am so confident that it is possible that the Lord will do a new thing. Brothers and sisters, welcome to our season of new things. Welcome to the season of new things. Welcome to a new season. Lift up your voice and let's give him thanks tonight and worship him. Bless the name of the Lord. Give him praise. Give him praise.